Hello, friends! It's me, Torin. This is Torin's Guide to Everything. It's been a while since I made an episode, and for that I apologize. Now, normally I will do the first segment will be something that I put a lot of research into and kind of personalized. And then the second half will be just something I read off the internet. Now, I have been working lately on actually putting together a video, a Torn's Guide to Everything video about motion comics, as I have some personal experience. But I just wanted to get off a quick audio podcast in the meantime before this becomes ready, because I wanted to let everyone know that there is a movie, an Indiegogo fundraiser movie for my friend Mike Jackson's movie, Time Helmet. Time Helmet. Time Helmet. Which I have a small role in. And you may know, if you are familiar with my band, The Darkest of the Hillside Thickets, you may know him as the director of our video for videos for 20 Minutes of Oxygen and Arachnotopia more recently. And if you haven't seen those, well, by God, you get onto that YouTube and you Google 20 Minutes of Oxygen and Arachnotopia video by the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets. Now, this movie, Time Helmet, Time Helmet, Time Helmet, is a sci-fi comedy feature. They're looking for 13000 to shoot the second half. They've already shot the first half. They're in progress of shooting the second half. And there's only a few days left at the time of my recording. So please go to Indiegogo.com. And plug in Time Helmet Movie Finishing Funds and donate whatever you can to help finish this, what is sure to be an amazing film, with Peter New, another friend of mine. You may know him from My Little Pony as the voice of Big Mac. And more recently, a Discord in My Little Pony, Pony Life. He's been in Supernatural. He's been in iZombie. He's been in Jim Henson's Turkey Hollow? And Mike Jackson's other films, Dial A for Alpha Man. And Woodman. So please do go to Indiegogo.com project slash Time Helmet Movie Finishing Funds and help get this wonderful project made. Time Helmet. Time Helmet. Time Helmet. And without further ado, here is the rest of this slat together episode of Torn's Guide to Everything. <laughs> Here's a fun one. This comes from ConnecticutMag.com. Eric Ofgang is the author, March 18th, 2020. The title is How a Bloodthirsty Hybrid Beast Terrified Townsfolk in the 60s. The Glowacus had returned. The strange half-cat, half-dog creature with a bit of bear thrown into the ungodly mix was prowling the woods of Essex, thirsty for blood. Blood? Blood. First spotted in the Connecticut wilderness decades earlier, rumors and apparent sightings had persisted over the years in Connecticut and beyond. But this was different. On September 15, 1966, the New Era, a weekly newspaper out of Deep River, described how several people, including First Selectman Escott McQuinney, saw the beast now dubbed the Gloacus, with an O instead of an A, Gloacus. The newspaper the newspaper. The newspaper even ran a blurry photo. By the end of the day, the population of Essex was in a panic, Batman. Stephen Gencarella, or Jen Carella, writes in Spooky Trails and Tall Tales, Connecticut. Jen Carella, a Connecticut resident and professor of folklore studies at the University of Massachusetts, continues. School children were frightened. Concerned teachers, parents, and citizens lit up the switchboard at the station and the town hall, and organized parties of terrified hunters were out in the woods with guns loaded. The first sightings of the Gloacus occurred around January 1939 in the woods and fields of Glastonbury. That winter, pets and livestock turned up mutilated. There were large tracks in the snow. Some residents reported hearing a terrifying, unearthly scream. Others saw a strange-looking creature, but descriptions of it varied. There was talk that it might be a mountain lion, a large bobcat, or some other predator. Then, the media circus began. While some local newspaper accounts were straightforward in their coverage of the mysterious beast, the Hartford Courant got spirited in its descriptions. A January 15th story about a hunt for the creature dubbed it the Glastonbury What Is It? and began with a poem. 
Say did the fearless hunters pick up the beastie spoor while trekking through the jungles with steps alert and sure? Three days later, on January 18th, Courant editor Francis King ran the infamous headline, Guffaws of Glastonbury Glowacus greet gloomy gang of gunners. The Glowacus name was a combination of Glastonbury and wacky, with the Latin us ending to make it sound more scientific. With its new name, the Glowacus found fresh popularity and was written about in outlets across the country. The missing animals in Glastonbury were no hoax. No, no, no. At least two dogs were killed, more were injured, and livestock disappeared. Tourists flocked to town to try to glimpse the beast, and there were Glowacus dances and Glowacus-themed competitions of various kinds. Within a few months, Hoopla, surround, which sounds like its own monster, Hoopla surrounding the beast died down. According to some reports, the source of attacks on town animals had been an emaciated brown dog that was ultimately captured in a bear trap and killed. But the legend of the Gloacus did not die a dog's death. By spring, it was on the move again. On April 1st, the Springfield Republican ran the headline, Intrepid Explorers to Track Down Horrifying Ectoplasmic Gloacus. The first hunt took place at the Indian Oven Cave in Millerton, New York, just over Connecticut's western border. The April 1st publication should have been a tip-off that something wasn't right, but coverage of the intrepid explorers and their hunts over the next few weeks appeared in newspapers throughout New England and beyond. As part of the hunt, a woman was lowered into the cave to bait the Gloacus. King Kong was released six years earlier, and many members of society apparently still believed that unusual animals were drawn to beautiful women. The organizers of the hunt were Clay Perry, a pioneering cave explorer credited with coining the term spelunker, and Roger Johnson, a fellow spelunking enthusiast who knew a thing or two about myth-making, as the son of Clifton Johnson, a renowned New England folklorist. Not a florist, a folklorist. Glen Cara... Glen... Oh, God. Glen Carella writes... The widespread appeal of the Cloacus was just what the two men needed to inspire interest in caving. Their hunts concluded on April 23rd when they supposedly cornered and killed the Cloacus at the Bashful Lady Cave in Salisbury. Do, 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 do. Lately, later, the men would freely admit they had staged the whole thing. Oh, however, their efforts provided exposure for the new sport of caving and solidified a connection between the Gloacus and Spelunking that remains active today, with many caving groups using various artists' renderings of the creatures as their mascots. But no account of the by turns terrifying and comical beast raised more panic than the 1960s Essex sighting. To calm a horror-stricken public, the rightly skeptical local police had to intervene. They tracked the story to Alfred Knapp, a wealthy metallurgist... <laughs> who owned 200 acres of woodlands in the area and ran a charitable organization for children to experience camping. Okay. Wow. He was known for telling ghost stories at the camp and had convinced McQuinney, Essex's first selectman, to go along with the ruse. McNapp issued a half-hearted apology in the new era the next week. Decades later, it remains a hoax for the ages and another reminder to read all news with a critical eye. I'm tapping on my eye right now. It's very painful. Though Canap's Mia Culpa ran in September, this is especially true on the first day of the month of April. Dun, dun, dun! When we last left our heroes... You stand before a decrepit old wizard. Adventures! Your next quest is to convince the listener to subscribe to the Dungeons & Dragons live play podcast, Adventure.exe. Roll initiative. All right, so uh, so I think what Rufus, the uh, human bard, is going to do is he's going to uh, offer a bribe. Yeah, a bribe. Uh, everyone, empty out your pockets. Oh, come on. Uh, all I've got is uh, some buttons and some lint. But I put you're going to bribe. Pot. You should use your own money. 
Well, I, I put off my buttons. I don't know what more you want. How much could a bribe cost? A hundred gold? Two hundred? Polly, do you have any money on you? Yeah, I don't have any money, but I, I can cast friends. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll uh, give you a bardic inspiration to your friends. I'll uh, could, could I'll do some it? farting noises to give you uh, inspiration. <laughs> could you cast friends on, like, everybody who's listening? Like, yeah. Like, all at once? Yeah, DM. I'm going to cast friendship on everybody who's listening, so they subscribe to our podcast. Yeah, and source all those bastards. You've worn down the listeners with your ridiculous shenanigans. And our magic. And and, and magic, and also bribery. <laughs> the universal language. <laughs> they go to their podcast service of choice and subscribe to Adventure.exe. You all level up. Yeah! It's so sure. I'm going to steal my money back. Here now, from Gizmodo, 2015 by Esther Inglis Arkell, the word of the day is auto-amputation. It means a limb, usually a toe has decided to slowly amputate itself. The other word of the day is idiopathic. It means no one knows why it happens. Idiopathic. Today, this condition is called dacty... Oh, shit. Dactylolysis spontanea. Dactylolysis spontanea. Oh, my God. When it first made official medical journals, it was called inhum. A-I-N-H-U-M. Brazilian doctor Silva Lima made note of it in 1867. Since then, there have been many cases worldwide, all of them unexplained. First, a little band of tough tissue forms around the base of the pinky toe. Usually, the band forms on each pinky toe, because why not have horrors be symmetrical? Eventually, the band gets smaller and tighter, and the toe swells up. The toe, naturally, hurts, but there is nothing amiss with the rest of the person. They get to watch as the band gets narrower and tighter, breaking the bones in the toe as it constricts. The toe ends up hanging by a pedicle, a tiny bit of tissue and bone. Eventually, even that gives up the ghost, and the toe drops off. The process, or process, if you're American, can take years. There's no treatment other than hacking off the toe at the start in order to save pain and time. No one has any idea why it happens. The most anyone knows is that it tends to happen more frequently to people in the tropics and people of African descent. But since doctors don't know the cause, there's no way to be sure you won't wake up one morning and realize that your own toe is defecting. Isn't that interesting, people? Thank you for listening. I have been Torin, your guide to these these everythings. Stay tuned for an announcement on my motion comics video episode and once again indiegogo.com slash time helmet time helmet time helmet movie finishing funds thanks for listening be safe out there wear your masks watch out for wildfires if it's that time of year and i'll see you on the internet Hey, it's Sarah from Adventure EXE. Why not tell your friends about Torn's Guide to Everything? If you have ideas for future episodes, questions, or just want to complain, well, you're going to have to go and like the Facebook page, subscribe to Torn Atkinson's YouTube channel, and tweet him at, at Thickets. And if you like this content, go to patreon.com slash Torn Atkinson and throw him a couple of your Earth dollars. Torin would love it. Music generously provided by Thomas Falk. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the internet. The widespread appeal of the Gloacus was just what the two men needed to inspire interest in, in, in shit. I can't I keep fucking it up. <laughs>